you appreciate this good singing this morning. Praise God. So good to see you here today. We're just tinkle, tickled pink to have you in service today. This is Pink Sunday, as you probably can tell. And this is uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We designated this Sunday. We had Ladies' Day last Sunday, and today is Pink Sunday. And today we're going to be recognizing some very special ladies, I think, at the end of the service. So you want to hang around for that. We're delighted to have you. I wonder if we have any first-time visitors here today. Can I see your hand? Anyone here? Very first time. God bless you for being with us. Amen. Any returning visitors? We're glad to have you. Would you let them know you appreciate them coming? God bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord. We remind you that we are having service tonight at 630. We hope that you'll make plans to come and be with us this evening. This coming Tuesday night, we're going to be having a special time of prayer from 5 to 6. We'd love for you to come out and be with us as we pray about the upcoming election, pray for our nation. So many things to pray about and pray for. We want you to join us in prayer. If you can't come, do take some time to pray for these very special needs. This coming Wednesday night, we're going to kick off a four-week meeting with Dr. Tom Tatum. He'll be with us for four Wednesday nights in a row, and he's going to be speaking about these end times. And he is a... Uh, outstanding speaker. He will bless you with the Word of God. I talked to him this week and he's excited about coming and uh, sharing with us what's happening, what's going on, maybe some of the questions you have. He'll be able to answer those. So we're looking forward to him being with us starting Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Make sure and attend. We're asking all of our young people, all of our other classes to be in here as well. We want them to sit in on these very special sessions. A lot of things are happening. A lot of things are going on. It lets us know we're nearer home than we were yesterday. The Lord is soon coming. We pray that we can do our best to win the lost, to rescue the perishing, to get as many people ready before the Lord comes. Would you stand as we get ready to go to the Lord in prayer? Brother Sister Marino called and asked us to remember them. They're not feeling well today. Pray God will touch them. And there's so many others that are sick and need of healing. Let's pray that God would move upon them and pray for this service, that God would move in a special way. Father, we thank you today for allowing us to come together in your house. Thank you for the privilege we have to assemble together and to know, Lord, that you're here today to minister to us and speak to us. We ask you, Lord, to help us today that we'll hear from heaven. We'll hear your instruction, your direction for our lives. We bring, Lord, that you'll bring healing to the sick bodies, those that are not able to be here today. We pray for their healing and their deliverance, that you'd move upon all that are lost. They would feel your convicting power. Lord, the day we ask you to move upon our nation, we pray, God, that many would turn to you and begin to call upon your name, that there would be a great revival throughout the land. Let your anointing rest upon us. We praise you, Father, for all these things. For it's in the lovely name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen and amen. Would you take a moment, welcome one another, as much as you feel comfortably still doing, to the Matthews Church of God. We're delighted to have you today. in our tithes and offering. From James 4, it says, Come now, those who say, Today, tomorrow, let's go to such, such a city, and spend there a year, buy and sell and profit, whereas you do not know what tomorrow will hold. With everything going on today, let us not be robbed of today. 
Let us worship and acknowledge God in all his ways. Let us celebrate the opportunity to worship him and give him. Dear sweet Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. We thank you, Lord, for the sweet spirit that we feel here today. We pray, God, that you would bless this offering for your glory. In your precious name.
We have so much to praise him for today. Come on, church. Praise him. He's real. He's holy. He's real. He's holy. Hallelujah. We worship you, God. Jesus, you deserve our highest praise. Glory to your name, Father. Come on, you want the devil to leave you today? All you got to do is open up your mouth and begin to praise God today in spite of your circumstance. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh! 
you for setting us free, God. Hallelujah. I bless your name. I bless your name. Come on, just worship him. I give you
just lift your hands right now in his presence. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, would you give the Lord praise? Hallelujah. Praise God for his presence. Thank you, singers and musicians. Thank you for leading us into the presence of the Lord. And I feel his presence, don't you? Praise God. It's so good to feel God's touch today. Praise God. Just remain standing, if you will, for the reading of the Word of God. I'm reading from the book of Joel, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, and then skipping down to verses 13 and 17. Let me say it's good to see all of Brother Rome's family here today. You win the pack of few Sunday. If we were having that, we're delighted to have all of you here in service. I tell you, when they were singing, Draw Me Nearer, I felt his touch. I want to get as close to him as I can. A lot of folks are seeing how far away they can live from him without missing heaven. I don't want to take that chance. I want to nudge up close to him. I want to be like John. John was known as the disciple that Jesus loved. Why? Because he was always up against Jesus, always close to him. It was John who said, I love him because he first loved me. Praise God for his presence, his anointing today. I want to preach a message the Lord has laid on my heart and I won't be able to finish it all this morning. I want to get into it tonight, the Lord willing. Dealing with the last days, the end times, I think that's on everybody's minds. I don't think we've ever heard so many people praying for the coming of the Lord as we're hearing now. So many people are saying, Lord, please come. We want you to come. Things aren't getting better. They're getting worse. We're praying for his soon return and we turn to the book of Joel. He says, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Bethuel. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. Gird yourselves and lament. Ye priests, how? Ye ministers of the altar, come. Lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God. For the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. Let the priests, let the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord. Give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? I want to speak this morning on the subject, the final chapter, the final chapter. Pray with me and pray for me today that God would move in a mighty way. Father, we thank you for allowing us to feel your holy presence. How blessed, how privileged we are to be in the presence of such a holy God our creator, our deliverer, our help in trouble. Lord, we pray today that you would speak to us. We have come together today to worship you. We've come to lift up our voices in praise to you. Lord, I pray, God, for your touch. I ask you, Lord, to enable me, to anoint me, to empower me to minister the word today. For I know apart from you, I can do nothing. I pray the burden of the Lord would be upon me. I pray, God, that you would help me to speak the truths of the word. Lord, let our eyes be opened. Let our ears re hear and our hearts receive. Let us feel the challenge of the Spirit, the nudging, the urgings of the Spirit. Help us, Lord, all today to make our calling and our election sure, to know that when we leave this building today that our sins are under the blood, that our names are in the Lamb's Book of Life. We welcome you, Holy Ghost. We welcome your manifestation. We welcome your demonstration. We praise you, Father, for all these things. For it's in the lovely, holy, and wonderful name of Jesus Christ we pray and ask it all. Amen and amen. You may be seated. The name Joel means Jehovah is God. Many scholars think that he may have been a priest from Jerusalem as well as a prophet because he gives so many details about the temple. Joel is sometimes called the prophet of Pentecost because he prophesied the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. In fact, Simon Peter referenced him and mentioned his name. 
in, in the book of Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. He said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Verse 1 says, the word of the Lord that came to Joel. That's what we need today. We need the word of God. We need to hear from heaven. We need to hear what God is saying to the church. And these 73 verses in this little prophetic book serve to warn us and to call us to have a clear view of the judgment that is coming on this earth. It's an invitation, it's a call to miss the judgment that is coming and it is coming. Luke 21, 34 through 36, Jesus said, and take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life that that day should take you unaware. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the earth. And then he says, watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Always stay alert, he says. Be on guard, be attentive, be ready and pray that you will be found worthy to escape all these things that are coming on this earth and are about to take place. The prophet Amos echoed that message in Amos chapter six, verse one, woe to them that are at ease in Zion and who trust in the mountain of Samaria. We live in a generation that has put everything ahead of God and a generation that has essentially abandoned God. Notice what he says in verses two and three again. He says, hear this, ye old men, and give ear all ye inhabitants of the land hath this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. Notice those first two words. Hear this. Hear this. It means listen to pay attention to what he is saying. Today it would be something like hearing the tone of the emergency broadcast system or a siren to get your attention, hear this. Then he asks the question, has anything like this ever happened before? Has anything like this ever happened? Joel says that something is about to happen unlike anything seen by this generation. We've seen a lot, we've witnessed a lot, but nothing can compare to what is about to take place. This is the final chapter. Judgment is coming and it will be unlike anything in your days or in the days of your fathers. He says, parents warn your children. Grandparents warn your grandchildren and your great grandchildren. And these verses make us aware that something terrible is about to happen. He's calling the ministers, he's calling the priest to mourn to cry, to weep. Why? Because judgment is coming. Let me tell you today that we are coming to the final chapter. We're here, we're at the end. We've come to the end. These are the last days. And there's a sense of finality in the air. I remember back in 07 when my dad and my brother passed in the same week. One of the things that, that I, I took from that was was the finality of it all. There's the certainty of death, but then there's the finality of it all. It's not like they have gone to the hospital and they're gonna be treated and come back home. It's not like they've gone off on a trip somewhere and they're coming back. They've been gone ever since. There's that finality of it all. We sense a finality of it all in the air today. And when you come to this final chapter, when you come to the final chapter of the book of all things, you know the story is almost complete. You know the story is wrapping up if there's some kind of a mystery in a book that you're reading. If you know there's a mystery in the plot, then you know that mystery is about to be revealed in the final chapter. 
Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. The Greek word apocalypse, it, it, uh, the Greek word for apocalypse is uh, apocalypsis. And it literally means to reveal. It means to disclose. It is the revealing of the end times. It's the time of the apocalypse. The final chapter means it's almost over and we're coming to the end. Never have we heard people saying, Lord, please come. Lord, please come. I want you to come. I'm looking for you to come. John himself said, even so, come, Lord Jesus. He heard Jesus say it three times. Behold, I come quickly. And John said, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Throughout the Bible, plagues are judgments from God. God sent 10 plagues upon Egypt because they refused to let the children of Israel go free. Exodus 5 and 2, and Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Notice what he says. Pharaoh asked the question, Who is the Lord? He doesn't know the Lord. And then Joel says, They would say, Where is their God. People have gone from not knowing God to knowing him and rejecting him. Romans 1.21 because that when they knew God they glorified him not as God neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and foolish in their foolish heart was darkened. There's such a disregard for God until the only recourse is judgment. It's the only recourse Plague after plague came upon Egypt as judgment from God. The plague where the water was changed to blood. The plague of frogs that covered the land. The plague of lice, the plague of flies. The plague of livestock, pe livestock pestilence. The plague of boils. The plague of hail. The plague of locust. The plague of darkness. And finally the plague of the death of the firstborn. Exodus 11, 11 and 6 says there shall be a cry, a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt such as there was none like it nor shall be like it any more. Just as sure as judgment came upon Egypt, it's coming on this sin-cursed world. If you ignore the warnings, then there is no other recourse if you ignore the warnings, there's no other, no other opportunity. Proverbs 29, 1 says, He that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. People have ignored the dark, ominous clouds that have been rolling in. They've been ignoring those. They've ignored the plagues. They've ignored the chaos in the streets. They've ignored the violence. They've ignored the vulgarity. They've ignored it all. Whatever you do, don't ignore the things that God puts in your path to keep you from judgment. Whatever you do, don't ignore what God has put in your path to keep you from judgment. He has put the word of God in your path to keep you from judgment. The Bible stands between you and judgment. The word of God stands there. You cannot go very far down the path of sin without finding the Bible standing in your way. The Bible is one of the greatest hindrances to sin in the world. It is the great disturber, disturber of all of history. You can never get rid of the word of God. He said heaven and earth is going to pass away one day, but my word, it shall not pass pass away. His word is forever settled in the heavens. The message of the Bible will haunt you until you find peace with God or until you face judgment. Many years ago, there was a young woman who attended a revival meeting. The preacher preached that night on Amos 4.12, prepare to meet thy God. She knew she wasn't ready. She knew she wasn't ready to meet God. She tried to forget the words. She tried to just walk away from the words, but they haunted her day and night. She had the words coming to her mind as she sat at her meals. 
They haunted her as she went to work. They haunted her as she tried to sleep. All she could hear was prepare to meet thy God. Prepare to meet thy God. They haunted her until one night about two o'clock in the morning. She called up her parents and said, I've got to give my heart to God. I've got to make peace with God. And she was saved because God in his wisdom, in the wisdom of God, it pleased God to choose the foolishness of preaching to save them that would believe. You cannot go into hell without climbing over every gospel sermon that you've ever heard. You better listen to the word of God that is trying to keep you from judgment. Don't ignore the word of God. God has put prayer in your path to keep you from judgment. Prayer makes a difference. I believe it's because of praying people that many people have been kept from judgment. I believe it's the prayers of the saints that make a difference. There are many praying mothers and fathers that have kept their children from judgment. Many years ago, out of the Midwest, there was a young man who had run away from home and he got with the wrong crowd. With his life in shambles, he found himself in a revival meeting one night. Conviction came upon him and he got saved and he got baptized. He wrote home to his parents and told them what had happened in his life. About a week later, he received a reply from his mother in an envelope that was bordered in black. And the letter said, my dear son, the joy which your letter brought to our hearts was exceeded only by the sadness which was here at the same time. As far as we can determine, the same hour that you stood for Christ in that meeting, your father was going into the heavens. All day long he tossed upon his bed and every little while he would cry out, oh God, save my wandering boy today. We tried to divert his attention from your waywardness and sin, but his mind seemed to roam from place to place. And then he would cry out again in sorrow, Oh God, save my wandering boy today. Just as he passed away, he cried, Oh God, save. And then in the midst of that sentence, in that moment, he died. He must have finished his prayer in the presence of the Lord Jesus. Down at the bottom of the letter, she wrote this. She said, You're a Christian today because your father would not let go in prayer. I believe prayer has kept a lot of young people and children from judgment. The prayer, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Oh, when we pray, oh, the devil begins to tremble. When we call on the name of the Lord, the devil has to back up. He has to back down. He has to let go because there's power in prayer. Praise God forever. Oh, praise God, I feel him. Judgment is coming. And the one thing that may keep you from it is the prayers and the tears of a mother and a father. Jesus has put the cross of Calvary in your path to keep you from judgment. There was a skull-shaped hill called Golgotha. That's the place where Jesus died. That's where he suffered and died for your sins and died for my sins. Blood flowed from his hands. Blood flowed from his feet. Blood flowed from his sides. Blood flowed from his back. Blood flowed from under his brow. He was mocked and jeered by those who crucified him. He cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Yet there was no fault in him. There was nothing that could find wrong in him and yet he suffered all of this. Why? Because he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. He died for us. And anyone who ignores and makes light or tramples on the blood of Jesus Christ will face judgment. Did you do you understand this morning what a great price has been paid for your sins? Do you understand what a great price has been paid to keep you out of hell? A great price Jesus hung on the cross. 
His flesh was mangled and blood was flowing, begging you not to die in your sins. He hung on the cross so that we might have eternal life. He died for our sins. He took the punishment. He became the perpetuation of our sins. He died in our stead. He didn't have to die. He didn't have to die, but he did. He chose to die. He became a willing sacrifice. He volunteered to go to the cross for you and for me. I should have suffered. I should have died, but Jesus God's son took my place. Someday death will suddenly show up at your door and the hearse will take your body away. But after this is the judgment, the judgment. Billy Graham only presided over one presidential funeral and it was that of President Richard Nixon. As he was preaching the funeral, there were five U.S. presidents that were sitting before him as well as a worldwide audience. He pointed down at at Nixon's coffin and he said, every one of you will be here one of these days. Are you ready? Don't save the world and lose your own soul. People live for this day and they live for this world and they live for pleasure and they live for all these things but one day you too will die for it is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. And the only thing that can keep you from the judgment is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You will have to stand at the judgment bar of God and give an account for your sins because the old account was settled long ago. Oh, Jesus nailed my sins to the cross. He died in my stead. Oh, he washed away my sins and made me white as snow. Hallelujah. I tell you what else he's done. He's put the Holy Ghost in your path to keep you from judgment. The Holy Ghost at some time or another pleads with every human being. John 16 and 8, and when he, the Holy Ghost, is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. You know, folks come to Pentecostal church and they say, you know, there's something a little different there. You know, I felt something there. There's, there's, there's just something about the way they sing and the way they preach and the way they pray and the way they worship. You want to know what the difference is? It's the fullness of the Holy Ghost. It's the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. But there are those who have drifted away from the church. They've drifted away from the Bible. And suddenly, they feel uneasy. They feel unrest. They feel dissatisfaction. It could be from the prayers of the saints, somebody praying, oh God, don't let them be lost. Make them miserable. Don't let them rest. Don't let them have any enjoyment in life until they come to you. But it's the Holy Ghost that does the conviction. The Holy Ghost moves upon you. He's calling you. He's knocking on your door. Does it bother you to sin? Does it bother you? Does it keep you awake at night? If it does, you better not ignore it because that's the Holy Ghost saying you need to repent of your sins. You need to return to God. You need to turn away from sin. John the Baptist echoed over the Judean Valley. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The last message Jesus had for the church was repent. He wants us to turn away from the world, turn away from sin, turn away from darkness, turn away from ungodliness and turn to him. He's the savior. He's the sanctifier. He's the Holy Ghost baptizer. He's the deliverer. He's the healer. He's the present help in trouble. He's the bread of life. He's the hidden manna. He's the well of living water. He's everything you have need of. Hallelujah. 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 You can ignore the preacher. You can laugh and mock at the church. But you better not ignore the Holy Ghost. I'm glad I can feel the Holy Ghost, hallelujah. You know, if you can be stoic, if you can be so hard-hearted and unmoved and unstirred, God, have mercy on you. But oh, it still brings a tear to my eye. It still disturbs me. It still bothers me to see the sin and the ungodliness. If you're full of the Spirit, what grieves the Spirit grieves you. You feel the Spirit of God within you. Could it be, let me ask you today, could it be, 
that this plague, this pandemic, this coronavirus, could it be a warning? Could it be a warning? Pharaoh ignored warning after warning. One plague came and went. Two plagues came and went. He ignored them. Just how many plagues do we have to face? Just how much sorrow and suffering do we have to face? It took 10 plagues for Pharaoh. His heart was so hard. It used to be, I was an evangelist for a number of years. Started preaching when I was 17 years old and I still, I don't have a photographic memory. I told somebody uh, as soon as I got a photographic memory, they quit making film. I ran out of film. I, I wish I could remember stuff, you know, but there's some things that are embedded in my memory have altar calls when people would come when I was a young evangelist, just a teenage evangelist, give altar calls. Not only would the altars be filled from one side to the other, they would be backed up in the aisles. They'd be three and four deep in the aisles, people weeping their way to victory. But today, just as soon as you say dismissal, just as soon as you pray the benediction, they'll say, what about them cowboys? Or what about this? Or what about that? There's no conviction. There's no story. God help us to humble humble ourselves and yield ourselves under the mighty hand of God. It took the death, it took the death of the firstborn to get him to say, I'll let him go. And Exodus 11 and 6 says, then a loud wail will rise throughout the land of Egypt, a wail like no one has heard before or ever will hear again. Such weeping such sorrow it doesn't have to be so. This Bible says there's weeping and there's gnashing of teeth in hell, in the darkness of hell. People are saying, you know, I sat on a church pew. I heard the word of God. I was given an invitation and I got up and walked out of the church like I was going to live a thousand years. I didn't realize that my life was about to end. I didn't realize that I was going to give an account for my sins. Oh God, help us not to ignore the Holy Ghost. Why? Because judgment is coming. Could it be that we're heading in the judgment a lot faster than we even realize? Could it be that we're closer than we realize? Could it be that we have reached the final chapter? A terrible plague of locusts came on Israel. It was a judgment from God. The plague was so devastating. The Bible says that these swarming locusts, they devoured everything. Nothing was left behind. It was a plague of devastation. There were no grapes, there were no figs, there was no grain for cereal. It was all destroyed. And Joel called Israel to cry to the Lord because of this judgment. Because he said in chapter two, he warned that this, what was happening in chapter one, was just a prelude of what was to come. He said, this is nothing compared to what's coming. I wanna tell you, this plague, this, this coronavirus, this pandemic, whatever it's called, whatever you wanna call it, how, how miserable we are, we hate the mask, we hate the isolation, we hate the destruction it's caused, the death it's caused, we hate it, but it's only a drop in the bucket of what's coming on the face of this earth. Joel 2 and 2 says, a day of darkness, of gloominess, a day of clouds, and of thick darkness, Joel called on the priest. He said, pray. He called on people that know how to pray. He called on people who know how to get a hold of God. He said, pray that the heritage of God will not become a byword among the nations. This world is on a collision course with Almighty God. Collision course. God is loving. Oh, yes, he is. That's the message that, that is predominantly preached these days. God of love, a God of prosperity. God wants to bless you coming in and going out, make you the head and not the tail. That's the message you hear today. He is also a God of love. He is a God of, of grace. He's a God of mercy, but he's also a God of justice and he's a God of judgment. Judgment is coming according to the word of God. This old world is a sinking ship. It's taking on water fast. It ran into an iceberg of sin and it's sinking fast. This is one of the most critical hours in the history of this world. China, you heard me preach about it several weeks ago about being the sleeping giant. Well, China is wide awake. China, the sleeping giant, is wide awake. 
The Middle East is a tender block, a tinder box that's ready to be ignited at any given time. The prestige of the nation that we love is gone. It's gone. The prestige of this nation is gone. As someone has said, we live in the theater of the absurd. How absurd. You scratch your head. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I'm not the brightest bulb in the chandelier, but when I hear some of the idiotic things that are being said, when I hear what's being told through people that's supposed to be leaders of the nation, I think, oh God, if that's the leadership, if that's what we're following after, if that's what we're depending on, we're in serious trouble. I'm gonna be like David who said, I'll look to the hills from which cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. He's the wise one. He's the counselor. He's almighty God. In 1912, H.G. Wells said this. It sounds familiar. It is possible for us to have a new race of people by intellectual and biological processes. We don't need the Bible. We don't need the church. We can pull down the hills of wealth. We can fill up the valleys of poverty, unquote. H.G. Wells must have had his head in the sand in 1937 like so many do today if they think we're on the verge of a utopia, if they think all of a sudden overnight they can pass this law and legalize this and, and make this come to pass and everything is going to be wonderful. H.G. Wells later said this. As he tried his best to get all this stuff together, he looked at humanity and he said, there is no hope for humanity. There's no hope for humanity. When you see the depravity of man today, you come to that same conclusion. There is no hope for humanity apart from God. Apart from God, there's no hope. There's no political party that can fix it. There is no serum that can fix it. Our help comes from the Lord. We've never seen so much depravity as we're seeing today. Iniquity has never swaggered like it swaggers today. There are more people lost in the world than ever before in any period of history, yet it seems like everybody is living like they're on the, on the brink or on the edge of a millennium instead of on the edge of judgment. People are living that way. They're living like they're going to be here forever. They are living as though they were in the first chapter and not in the final chapter. They're living as though that we're at the preface instead of at the epilogue. They're living as though we're in Genesis and not in Revelation. I want to tell you we're in the final chapter. This thing's wrapping up. We're already in Revelation. We're already there. We're very close to Revelation 4.1 where he says, come up hither. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Paul said the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord no wonder no wonder Joel says let the priests the ministers of the Lord let them weep between the porch and the altar we should be weeping over the drug and alcohol addiction that's gripped our land I heard them say the other day they said alcohol sales have gone to the roof and during this pandemic during this shutdown People are just drinking themselves silly. They can't get enough alcohol to deaden their feelings. We're, we're living in a land that we need to weep over, over pornography that has polluted the minds of men, women, and young people. I mean, they're steeped in the filth of this ungodliness, you know. Every time, I believe every time you look at pornography, a demonic spirit is looking back at you. You're inviting demons into your room, demons into your life, and you wonder why you're depressed. You wonder why you don't have any joy. You need to get the devil out of your house. Get the devil out of your room. As the psalmist said, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. If you're going to gaze on the holiness of God, you've got to get your eyes and your face out of the cutter, you've got to ascend the hill of the Lord with clean hands and with a pure heart. Oh, you want to know what's wrong with the church today? A majority of church people these days are involved and addicted to pornography and they wonder where the shout is, where the joy is. Why don't we have old time religion like we used to? We better repent of our sins, forsake our sins. He will have mercy and heal our land. We need to weep 
over abortion. Let me tell you, that's the two things that's going on right now. They won't tell you that. But all this fussing and squabbling and fighting and infighting, all this is going on, it's all about abortion and it's all about perversion. It's all about Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what it's about. We should weep over abortion. We should weep over the arrogant and militant paganism. We should weep over perversion. We should weep over rebellion. We should weep over confusion. People that don't even know whether they're male or female, how silly, how ridiculous that is. We should weep over the hypocrisy that we see. We should weep over hell. We should weep over judgment that is coming on this earth. If we told our grandparents that in the 21st century that homosexuals would parade down Main Street, they would say, not in America. They would never believe that the White House would one day be arrayed in rainbow colors to celebrate sodomy. They'd say, not in America. They never would have believed that New York would applaud and celebrate legalizing abortion up to birth by lighting the One World Trade Center in pink. They would never have believed that, but that's where we are. We are living in the days such as Lot. We're living in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, and there's judgment that's on the horizon. We've lost whatever morality we had as a nation, and we've lost our spirituality. Not only are we dealing with this plague from a virus, we're dealing with a plague of sin that's wrecking and ruining lives. Proverbs says, righteousness, righteousness, righteousness exalteth a nation. It's sin that's a reproach to any people. The psalmist said, the wicked, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. You know, they don't even want to say the name of God. They don't want to say one nation under God. They resent God. They hate God. They're anti-Christ. There's an anti-Christ spirit in the land. It's inviting the judgment of God upon this world. The only antidote for sin, the only antidote for our nation is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Thankful for the blood today. I'm thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ that washed away my sins. There's no doubt about it. We are seeing judgment because of sin. You can see it in the homes. You can see it in the population. You can see it in the streets. You can see it in the entertainment business. And most devastatingly at all, you can see it in the church. Why? Because judgment begins in the house of God. Let the priests, let the ministers weep. <laughs> let them weep between the porch and the altar and say, oh God, spare thy people. Spare thy people. We've come to the final chapter. Final chapter and it reveals the judgment of God. That's why the nation, our nation is in the shape that it's in this morning. I want our musicians to come if they will please. That's why our homes that's why they're in the condition they're in. That's why our churches are in the shape they're in. That's why we're in such a spiritual drought. That's why, why so many young people have little or no desire for God. That's why the church has become so cold and lifeless and impotent. Could it be we've been weighed in the balances and found wanting? The only hope we have is to repent and return to God for his divine intervention. Would you stand with me, please? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, praise God. Gird yourselves and lament, he said. How, you ministers? Cry before God, you priests and ministers. Weep before the altar because judgment's coming. Let me tell you, whether you believe it or not, it makes no difference. It's going to happen. Whether you believe it or not, whether you accept it or not, it's still going to happen. It's not me. It's not my words. It's the word of God. The Lord warned us that when we see these things, know that it's near, even at the door. I want the heads bowed just a moment. The saints are praying. I feel, I feel such a tug of God's spirit. Thank you, Lord, for your convicting power today. You know, I, I don't believe in just preaching to make people feel good. I don't want you just to come to church and tickle your ears. I have to preach what God lays on my heart. This is heavy on my heart. The judgment is coming. I'm really convinced. I believe what I preach today with all my heart. I believe we're in the final chapter. 
I believe the judgment of God is about to be revealed upon this sin-cursed world. People are running to and fro, rejecting, rebelling against God. They hate and despise the people of God. They hate the church. They hate Christianity. And I'll share some more about that tonight. But I want to tell you today that you've got to give an account for yourself. You've got to answer to God for yourself. You've got to make your calling and election sure. The young lady heard the message, prepare to meet thy God. She knew she wasn't prepared. She couldn't rest until she called on the name of the Lord to be saved. Let me ask you today, are you prepared to meet God? As Billy Graham said at the funeral, Richard Nixon, one day you too will be here. Are you ready? Are you ready to die? Because after you die, there's the judgment. So regardless of how you look at it, judgment's coming. It's coming after your death or it's coming on this earth. And the only safe harbor, the only safe place of safety is in Jesus Christ. Come to him. Would you come today, man, woman, young person? You've wandered far away from God, but today you're coming home. You've, re you've rejected. You've resisted. You've said no to God so many times. Why not say yes today? You know, in all my years of ministry, and I'm going on 50 years of ministry, 50, half a century, out of all the people I've heard get saved, not one time have I had anyone say to me, it's not what I thought it was. It's not as great as I thought it would be. But without exception, they always say, if I'd have known how wonderful it was, I would have come to Jesus a long time ago. I have such a peace. I feel so clean. I feel so good. That's what the Lord does. It's the greatest thing you'll ever know. The greatest thing you'll ever do is fall in love with Jesus Christ and allow him to be your Savior and Lord. Would you come this morning, man, woman, young person? You just feel, you just feel the need to pray. You just feel the need to repent of something. You just feel the need to get something under the blood today. You just feel the need to make sure that everything's all right between you and God. That's my daily prayer. Lord, I want everything to be all right between me and you. Lord, if there's anything, anything in my heart or my life, reveal it to me that I can confess it and forsake it, that I can please you, that I can do your will and your good pleasure. If you have any doubts, any questions, why don't you come today and pray them away? Come today. Come on today. Know that you're ready. Know that you're saved. Know that you're right with God. Come on. God bless you, young people. God bless you. Come on today. Lord, I want to be ready. It's coming. Judgment is coming on this earth. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming because the Word of God said it is. Prepare to meet your God. Maybe there's some family members. Maybe you have sons and daughters. Maybe you have grandchildren, brothers or sisters. Come and pray a prayer for them. Weep between the porch and the altar. Say, oh, God, save them. Don't let them be lost. Be like the old man who prayed for his son. Oh, God, save my son. Save him. Don't let him be lost. Come on and pray a prayer, will you? If you can't come, pray right where you are. Let the Lord touch you today.
bless his holy name. Praise God, praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, if you're on the losing side, if you're lost, great fear should grip your heart. But if you're rapture ready, joy should flood your soul. Praise God. It's going to be a glorious day when Jesus comes. And those loved ones that have gone on before us, we're going to see them again. That's the hope of the church and the promise we have of the Lord Jesus. That he is coming again and the dead in Christ are going to be called up. We can't go up till they get up. When they get up, we're going to be called up together with them. And to be with the Lord forever. We're not exciting. Praise God. I'm longing for heaven. Praise God. We have uh, some ladies committee that's coming this time to make presentation. We appreciate our precious ladies so much. So many of them have faced uh, surgery and difficulty, and uh, they've still got a testimony. They've still got praise for God, and uh, we're so thankful for them today. So we want to recognize them at this time. Do I need to give you more time? I can't sing, so we're in trouble. Amen. But we appreciate it. Do you want all the ladies to come up here? Is that what they normally do? All the breast cancer survivors, if you'll come and stand up front. Amen. They have a pink sash they've been given today, hopefully. And uh, we have several in the church. We have some that's already gone on to their reward. Amen. They, they've got a gold crown and where you have a pink sash. So they have finished this fight and this course. Thank God for these ladies. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. If you, if you didn't get a sash and you're a breast cancer survivor, would you, you're welcome to come. If you're visiting today, you're welcome to come. Amen. You, you deserve to be recognized and applauded because you are fighters, warriors, soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord has given you faith. He's given you strength and the ability to stand, and my goodness, what a, what a sweeter, more wonderful testimony you have because of what you've been through. The test has given you a great testimony. We thank God for you. Amen. Praise God. I think they're going to get a picture. Randy, you're getting a picture of them. Praise the Lord. And I think we have gifts to give. You're going to do that now? Okay. Amen. Give them a big hand. Thank you, ladies, so much. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Amen. We lost Sister Evelyn.